you have your Bible, please turn with me to the Old Testament book of Judges. This morning we're going to continue in Judges chapter 6, where we started a couple of weeks ago on the 16th uh, when I last preached. Uh, We've been working through, I've been working through as the times that I have preached through the book of Judges. If you've not been with us, the uh, overarching theme and, and the overarching takeaway from the book of Judges I've described as two wings of a plane, both needed, both essential to the operation. One wing of the plane is that you, all of you, every one of you, is in desperate need and has a great Savior for your need. Every one of you, one wing says, is in great need for saving. You are unable to save yourself. Your biggest problem in essence, is you and your own sin. But the other wing of the plane, again, just as necessary for the operation, is that there is a great Savior for your need. The book of Judges comes along and it gives us this message throughout its pages, throughout all the weird, wild stories that we have heard and read and the weird ones and the wild ones that are to come. As we've seen time and time again, there is a great need for salvation for God's people, but there is great salvation provided for their need. God raises up by His grace these deliverers to bring His people out of the oppression they have found themselves in by their own sin. And so we'll continue that this morning. We're going to look at Judges chapter 6. A little bit of a longer passage this morning, but I thought it would be profitable for us to read. Uh, read pretty much all of what we'll be covering at the beginning. You'll see in your bulletin that the passage is there. If you don't have a Bible, you're welcome to look there. There should be Bibles in uh, the chairs in front of you as well if you want to grab one of those. Um, We'll be looking at Judges chapter 6. We're going to read first verses 11 uh, through... Make sure I wrote the wrong right verse down. 11 through 32. And then we'll read verses 36 to 40. And so again, a longer passage, but I think profitable for us to have the whole thing ahead of time. Judges 6, 11 to 32, and 36 to 40. And this is God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth of Ophrah, which belonged to Joaz the Abiezrite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all His wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? And he said to him, Please send you. Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And he said to him, If now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Please do not depart from here until I come to you and bring out my present and set it before you. And he said, I will stay till you return. So Gideon went into his house and prepared a young goat and unleavened cakes from an ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket, and the broth he put in a pot, and brought them to him under the terebinth, and presented them. And the angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened cakes, and put them on this rock. Pour the broth over them, and he did so. Then the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of the staff that was in his hand, And touched the meat and the unleavened cakes, and fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. 
But the Lord said to him, Peace be to you. Do not fear, you shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it still stands at Ophrah, which belongs to the Abizrites. That night the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, and pull, it down, the alt- and pull down the altar of Baal, that your father has, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it. And build an altar to the Lord your God on top of the stronghold here with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night." When the men of the town rose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was broken down, and the Asherah beside it, it was cut down, and the second bull was offered on the altar that had been built. And they said to one another, Who has done this thing? And after they had searched and inquired, they said, Gideon the son of Joash has done this thing. Then the men of the town said to Joash, Bring out your son that he may die, for he has broken down the altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah beside it. But Joash said to all who stood against him, Will you contend for Baal, or will you save him? Whoever contends for him shall be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him contend for himself, because his altar has been broken down. Therefore that day Gideon was called Jerubbaal, which is to say that Baal, let Baal contend for himself, because he broke down his altar. And skipping down to verse 36. Then Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand as you have said, behold, I am laying a fleece of uh, wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. Then Gideon said to God, Let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please let me test just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece only, and on all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. And it was dry on the fleece only, and on all the ground there was dew. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, but the Word of our God will stand forever and ever. Let's pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, we thank You for that, uh, that, that long passage. God, so many details, so many things, so much that we could wrestle with and chew on and think through this morning. I pray that You would give us great clarity of mind as we approach Your Word. That by Your Holy Spirit, You would teach us that we would understand. We thank You for Your Word. We know that without Your help, Father, we could discern nothing from this passage. And so we ask that Your Holy Spirit would come down and do a mighty work in our hearts and minds, even this morning. We pray that Your people, those walking with Christ, would be nourished and fed by Your Word, that we might be edified, encouraged, challenged, convicted. We might see the glorious grace of God through the Lord Jesus anew this morning. Pray for any in the room who do not know Christ. We thank You that they are here. We thank You that they are worshiping with us. We pray, Father, that they would hear the Gospel this morning. That they would hear the glorious grace, joy, comfort, hope that is available in Jesus alone and that they, even today, might come to faith. Pray that You would do a mighty work even through me, a broken, weak, sinful vessel, Father. Do a mighty work this morning. It's in Christ that we pray. Amen. Well, as I mentioned this morning, we're continuing in the book of Judges, another story that has what seems like a lot of very random bits and pieces, a lot of moving parts, a lot of things that don't always seem to fit, and yet an incredible testimony of God's gracious provision for His people. We talked last time at the beginning of Judges chapter 6 how we looked at God's preparation. How He prepared His people for a mighty work of salvation. He did so by giving to them the reality that they needed. The awareness that they needed of their own sinfulness. right? 
but also He provided for them by showing them that there's a promise that they can't live without. This promise that He gives that He will be with them. Today we pick up the story in Judges chapter 6 with the beginning of the raising up of Gideon. How is God going to do this? He's going to do it through a man named Gideon. And we're going to talk through that today. How he turns the coward Gideon into a conqueror. And how God still today makes cowards into conquerors. I was reminded of a story this week as I prepared for this text. In 2011, the football team at the University of Tennessee found themselves in a predicament before their game against Middle Tennessee State on homecoming. The week before the game, their starting kicker had gotten injured in a game and was out. Their backup kicker pulled a hamstring during warm-ups. And so Tennessee was left without a kicker. Their head coach at the time, Derek Dooley, said to one of his assistants, we need to get the third string kicker ready for the game. There's one problem with that. The third string kicker, Derek Broaddus, was nowhere near the stadium. He was in a fraternity house down the street getting ready to go to the game with his friends and other students. Not being a scholarship athlete but a walk-on, he was not expecting to play. He was not expecting to get in any games, but he was nominally at least the third string kicker. He was in a fraternity house doing all the things I would assume you do in a fraternity house to prepare to go to a football game. I'll spare details. I'll give you, can allow you your mind to imagine and wonder. It's actually funny of reading the article of this game because after the game, the coach Derek Dooley was quoted as saying, I guess an intoxicated Broadus is better than nobody at all. And so there's a police escort that leaves Neyland Stadium at the University of Tennessee and drives down the road to this frat house, opens the door of the frat house and sees Derek Broadus sitting on the couch playing video games, wearing sweatpants, getting ready to go to the game later that afternoon. Police escort informs him of the situation. They get him up off the couch and they put him in the police escort to head back to the stadium. <laughs> My favorite detail of the story is when they got back to the stadium, they actually breathalyzed Derek Broaddus. And the story said, and I quote, he was in good enough condition to play. <laughs> good enough condition to play. Anyway, Derek brought us this kicker, played in the game, he kicked three extra points, and he made a field goal. So a successful game and a Tennessee win uh, for Derek brought us. But can you imagine that? You're sitting on the couch with your friends, wearing sweatpants, probably eating Cheetos and drinking a beverage of some kind. And in come the police and say, hey, you've got to go play a football game today. Suit up. You can imagine Cheeto dust still on your fingers having to go to the stadium and figure this out on the fly. That story came to mind this week, and, and it's, it's, it, it's one, it is legitimately one of my favorite stories that I've ever read um, in sports. The story came to mind, though, as I thought about Judges chapter 6. What we see happening here in the passage that we just read is somewhat akin to, to that story, minus several details. But when Gideon woke up that morning, you can imagine, I doubt he had any grand designs of being this mighty conquering deliverer of Israel. He didn't have any idea that he was going to tear down the local altar of Baal that belonged to his father. He had no idea that anything was going to take place. There's nothing from the text that indicates that Gideon was anything particularly special or different. He's just an ordinary guy. And yet God, here he comes busting through the door uh, metaphorically and says, it's time to get in the game, Gideon. It's time to get in the game. And this is what He still does for us. This is what He still does for His people. He calls us out of whatever we are doing to say it's time to take part in what I am doing to renovate the world, to make all things new. We saw last time, at the beginning of this chapter, God is setting up this glorious work of salvation of His people. And the question becomes, how is God going to do it? How is God going to bring about this great deliverance from the crushing load of the Midianites? 
He's going to take the coward Gideon and He's going to raise him up into a conqueror. And I think it's, it's always worth saying, it's always worth us remembering that this is a recurring thing throughout Scripture. This is not God's occasional creativity, but this is God's modus operandi to go and find weak, broken, frail, failing people and raise them up to do incredible works of grace and salvation. This is what we see time and time again throughout the Scriptures, and it's what we've seen time and time again so far in the book of Judges. Whether it was the the crippled left-hander Ehud, or it was the woman Deborah, or it was the coward Barak, or whoever it is, we've seen it time and time again. God raising up deliverers from cowards. And this text gives us insight as to how God goes about doing this. How God goes about raising up deliverers. And it's certainly a huge encouragement to us. I hope it serves as an encouragement to you as we kind of stand on the precipice of another year. As we contemplate the upcoming 2024. How does God work through and in His people? How does God do it? We see here in the text today. We're going to look at three things. There's an outline in your uh, bulletin if you're a note taker. There's not a lot of space thanks to the long uh, outline or long passage, so I hope you brought a notebook or something. So, but if you want to use that space, you're welcome to. I kind of want to see what you what you do with your small text. But let's look at the three points together: the raising up, the requirement, and the revelation. The raising up, the requirement, and the revelation, uh, with the verses that correspond to those sections. There, the first thing we see in the passage is God raising up this reluctant. Gideon. We meet Gideon for the first time in verse 11. Again, not a spectacular person. Not a spectacular character by any stretch of the imagination. We meet Gideon. He is in a wine press beating out wheat. Right. This is significant. The specificity of where Gideon is when we meet him. Uh, because remember last time as we began the chapter, we heard that God had raised up the Midianites to conquer and take over Israel. How did they do this? For the last seven years, the Midianites have been uh, sweeping into Israel right at the time of the harvest. And like locusts, they've been devouring everything. So this is a time of extreme scarcity in the nation of Israel. They have nothing. Right? The illustration of this is seen in the fact that Gideon is in a wine press beating out wheat. I don't know much about farming or beating out wheat. I know that a wine press is not the ideal place to do it, though, because you need wind in order to beat out wheat. That's the one thing that I know about wheat. Don't ask me any other questions. But you need wind. And there's no wind in a wine press. Right? This is a, not an ideal location. This is Gideon doing anything he can to scrounge up any morsel of food that he can find. Right? And he is uh, exemplary of the condition of Israel. This is what the Israelites are doing now. They are doing everything they can to survive. We read last time that they are so afraid of the Midianites that they've hidden in the caves. Right? They're hiding in the caves. They're so afraid. And here we see Midian. And the text even tells us that he's hiding the wheat from the Midianites. He's hiding this. And so we see this coward, this, this fearful Man, Gideon, we meet him. And this exchange takes place between Midian and the angel of the Lord who appears to him in verse 11. It's vitally important as we are to understand the story of Gideon, to understand the character and the story here, it's vitally important that we see what's going on, what the writer is doing here in the exchange between Gideon and the messenger of God in verses 12 and 24. The entire scene tells us a lot about the significance of Gideon. One commentator, actually two or three that I read, suggested this this week, is that the Gideon narrative, this serves as the turning point of the book of Judges. Nothing will be the same after this in terms of how deliverance is talked about, how the judges are talked about. Everything is different after this. Gideon is a turning point. That's why it takes three chapters to tell his story. We're going to see the rise and fall of Gideon in the next couple of weeks. So if Gideon's story is the turning point, what that means is that Gideon is the central figure of this book. Other than God Himself, of course. We've talked about God being the central figure in the book. 
But Gideon, from a human perspective, is the central figure. This whole story turns on him. How do we know this? What's the support for this? The main reason for this argument, and I think it's a good one, is the really, really strong similarities between this text in Judges 6 and the calling up of Moses in Exodus chapter 3. Who does the writer of Judges want us to think about when we read about Gideon? It's Moses. Who up until the time of Jesus Christ is probably the most important figure in the history of Israel. This is incredibly significant. And there are so many similarities in the story. It would take a long time to list them all, but I'll list some so that we can see these. The writer wants us to see Gideon as a kind of second Moses. The angel of the Lord appears to both men. He gives them a clear call to gather, lead, and deliver their people from the foreign oppressor. When we meet both would-be deliverers, Moses and Gideon, they are both in hiding. Moses hiding from Pharaoh and Gideon hiding his wheat from the Midianites. Both of them, when they're giving this clear calling to gather, lead, and deliver, are extremely reluctant, not just based upon the loftiness of the calling, but also based upon their own inadequacies, their own personal inability and status. In both cases, the Lord answers their reluctance with the exact same promise. He says the same thing. He says, I will be with you. Both here and there. Finally, and in both cases, the Lord gives each man multiple signs to confirm both His identity, His power, and His presence with them. There are several more. It's fascinating if you are a a text study person to go and study all of the uh, unique similarities between Exodus 3 and Judges 6. It's fascinating. But those are so many, uh, there's so many here, and I just listed several. The point here, the reason why this is important, is that if you understand Gideon as a type of second Moses, it puts his story into a whole new perspective. It helps really to understand and unpack who Gideon is supposed to be in our eyes as we read this story. He's not just some guy. He is the second Moses. We've covered much of the exchange between him and the messenger. We did in the last sermon I did a couple of weeks ago. Especially the Lord's promise in verse 16 where He promises that I will be with you. This great uh, assurance that no matter what, The Lord will be present. And that is all that is needed for Gideon to fulfill this calling. So we talked quite a bit about uh, those verses, that exchange. And so I'd like to move us ahead to verse 17. Because Gideon, after hearing this call to deliver, after hearing this promise that the Lord will be with him, Gideon wants to know exactly who he's talking to. He wants to know for sure that this is indeed the Lord God that he's speaking with. And in verses uh, 17 to 19, we get, uh, we get the beginnings of this sign. Gideon asks that the Lord would wait for him to prepare this sign. And he asks that the, that the messenger would wait. And he goes, the text says, and he prepares a young goat and unleavened bread from an ephah of flour. Now we have to understand, first of all, how extreme this offering is. In a time of extreme scarcity in a time where there is not food we just saw Gideon scrounging whatever he could to get wheat to eat in a wine press here we have Gideon preparing a young goat and what in an ephah of flour now an ephah most commentators think is about 35 pounds of processed flour 35 pounds of processed flour 22 liters it's it is a staggering amount of flour Staggering amount for a guy who was just beating out wheat in a wine press a few minutes ago. This would be an enormous offering in good times. It's even more so in times of want, which is this is certainly a time of want. And so we need to see that Gideon, while he's been characterized by many in this text as a sort of a, a, a fearful, cowardly, right, lacking in faith guy asking for these signs, the reality is Gideon is not messing around here. He wants to know without a shadow of a doubt 
what this is all about. And what does He do? He gives everything He has to this. This is a sacrifice in every sense of the word. He wants to know for sure. And so, here Gideon gives this very fervent, very sincere, very large offering as a sacrifice. And it's received by this messenger. Again, we see this in light of the story of Moses. Moses did the same thing. He, he asked God, how will I know for sure who, this, who I'm dealing with? And when I go to the people, how do I know they're going to listen? Remember that at the beginning of Exodus 4. How do they know? Or how do I know that they're going to listen? And what does God do to confirm to him that they're going to listen? He gives him signs. He shows him his power and his presence. And that's why this is done here. Verses 20-22, to we see the response. He tells Gideon to take the meat and the cakes, set them on a rock, pour the broth over them. And when Gideon does this, the angel puts the tip of his staff on the offering. Again, you can see similarities with the Moses story. The staff, the tip of the staff, and fire, and all these things. There's so much here. Put the tip of the staff on the offering, and it was in a moment, in a second, consumed. Gone. Fireball bursting from the rock, massive, powerful. You can imagine it knocked Gideon on his rear end as he is just totally amazed by what he's just seen. And then, not only that, but the angel of the Lord vanishes in the, in the midst of this. The angel of the Lord vanishes as this happens. And that's when Gideon knows. That's when Gideon is positive. He knows exactly what's going on here. And you can see it in his response Not only does the text tell us that he perceived that this was the angel from the Lord, but he also says, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And it's not really picked up in the English, but in the Hebrew text, you get a real sense of of not just assurance from Gideon, but but actual fear. What What does this sign confirm in Gideon? It's not mere assurance that this is God, but it is the fact that it is God. And and whenever you see God, whenever you're in the presence of God as a sinful person, a holy God, there is terror that follows. Gideon is undone by this. The same way Isaiah is undone in Isaiah chapter 6. The same way the disciples are undone at the Mount of Transfiguration when they see Jesus Christ in His glory. When you come into the real presence of the real God, What is the response? It is terror. Both at the glorious, holiness, righteousness, power of God, but at your own insignificance. And so Gideon is fearful. Gideon is terrified. Gideon is afraid. But here's the thing. God was not there to get Gideon. He's not there to to take Gideon away. He said he was with Gideon. He called this man to deliver Israel. Promised Gideon that he would have his full power and presence with him always. And as God displays his immense power in the midst of Gideon, and Gideon gets this full understanding of God's holiness and awesomeness, what is the first word that God speaks to Gideon in the midst of his terror? Shalom. Shalom. Peace be to you, Gideon. Do not be afraid. You will not die. Christian, do you have trouble believing that God can use you for anything? Do you have trouble believing that God could actually want you to be part of the work that He's doing in the world? Do you struggle to think that maybe you've messed up just one time too many? Maybe you have done just enough to make God no longer really all that interested in you? Do you fear that your weakness is too great for God to overcome? We must remember, and we must, we must take so much from this interaction, remember that when you were weak and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, just the right time, Jesus Christ died for your sin. Jesus Christ died to save you, was given as a sacrifice, consumed as a sacrifice. But not only that, you're invited to remember the stories of Moses and Gideon. 
There was nothing about these men that was special. Weak, insignificant, cowering. Moses was a murderer. They're just, they're just, they're hiding. And what does God do with hiders? What does God do with cowards? God calls them up, puts them in the game. Puts them in the game. And it's not just that He throws them in the game and says, here kid, figure it out. He gives you His power and His presence. What did, Matthew, or what did Jesus say in Matthew 28? Behold, I will be with you until the end of the age. Paul writes to the Corinthians that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and it is He who dwells within you. He's going to put you in the game, but He's going to give you His power and His presence to equip you for that work. And it does not matter how weak and failing you are. And in fact, weakness and failing is pretty much all you're bringing to the table anyway. That's all any of us are bringing to the table. So we see this incredible raising up of Gideon. This incredible display of God's power. But second, we see here the requirement. Because it's not just enough for Gideon to go and deliver his people from the Midianites. There's a requirement here in verses 25-32. to God has told Gideon that he's going to deliver the people. But then we have this sort of what seems like kind of a random aside. If you look at verse 25, it, it, the scene kind of changes. We get this second sort of vignette of the scene. And it sort of is random. It sort of seems out of place. The night... Uh, that night the Lord said to him, says the text, take your father's bull and a second bull, seven years old, pull down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the Asherah that is beside it. A very brief review, but we've covered this a lot. Uh, Baal is the primary god of the pagans, the pagan nations that surround Israel and the land and the promised land. He's the god of weather and fertility, so it's not just uh, it's not just kind of comfort, but it's, but it's actual prosperity that's offered in Baal. right? And Asherah would be one of the other primary gods. They had three uh, primary gods, and Asherah was known kind of as the mother goddess. And so there's, there's this god of fertility, god of weather, god of, uh, of the land. right? And then there's this mother goddess, this god of the land and fertility and, and all of that. This is all surrounded about prosperity, and this is why this pagan god is so enticing. Asherah was represented by trees. That was the representation. So the altar of Baal would involve an altar to Baal and a pole right beside it. That would be the pole of Asherah. That's what we're talking about if you can sort of visualize these things. And so God says, before you go and deliver my people from the Midianites, I need you to do one thing for me. Go tear down your father's altar to Baal. Cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Use the wood from the Asherah pole and sacrifice a bull to me on top of it. This is the requirement that's given to Gideon. Why is this why is this here? Why is this here? Why is this part of the story? It goes back to what we talked about at the very beginning of Judges. It's the same reason God wanted them to clear out the promised land. When he sent them in, he wanted them to clear out all the nations. Why? Why does God want them to tear down this altar? It's because two altars cannot coexist. It's because God is not going to share the stage. It's because when God calls you to Himself, when God calls you, God is the main one. The only one. God is it. Purge yourself of all other idols. And this, in our pluralistic you-do-you culture, is offensive and weird and out there. I think it's funny how we so often understand the concept of this in every other scenario but God. When we involve God in the Bible, suddenly we get exclusive and and offensive. But when we think about things like uh, your daughter or son falling on the ground and scraping their knee, what do you do first to that wound? You clean it. Why? You need to purge it of all the debris and all the dirt and all the stuff before you put a band-aid on it so it doesn't get infected. When you get a cancer diagnosis and you go and see the doctor, you don't ask the doctor to take out some of the cancer and let the rest of it just kind of hang out there. Why? Because invaders have to be removed. Evil has to be purged. Sickness has to be taken out. 
We understand this concept in every other. We can come up with so many other scenarios. And yet, when God and the Bible is involved, so many in our culture look at this concept and they say, man, God is this psychotic, brutal tyrant. He's a jealous God. When we see that God says, you shall not have any other gods before my eyes, it looks like exclusive jealousy. And yet, this makes total sense. This makes total sense. The only way that evil can exist is, that, is if God's not there. And the only way God can be there is if evil is gone. And so the idols have to be exposed and they have to be destroyed. And that's why God first calls Gideon to take down this altar to Baal. This agent of deliverance has to first take care of what most plagues Israel. What is Israel's greatest enemy? What is the biggest problem in Israel? It's not the Midianites. It's their own sinful, idol-loving hearts. And what is our biggest issue? What is our biggest problem? It's not the culture around us. It's not the rise of postmodernism. It's your own sinful, idol-loving heart. It's that you will run after any and everything that's not God for any sense of comfort, belonging, or fulfillment that you can get. And that you and I are the same in this. That you and I go after anything and everything that's not God. And God says there's only one thing that's going to give you what you want. There's only one thing that's going to make you feel fulfilled and joyful. There's only one thing that's going to give you hope. And it's me. And so what needs to be done before we are able to go and serve, before we are going to deliver, before we are going to do mighty works of grace for God, we need to have our idols called out and destroyed and wiped completely. We see that Gideon does what the Lord commands. I think it's an interesting note in the text that he does it overnight because he's afraid of his family and the men of his town. Many of us just came off holidays with family. We can understand the concept of kind of wanting to do things away from family. Not that family's not great. Don't hear me say that. You get that, right? Does it overnight. He's afraid of what the men of the town are going to do and what the family's going to think. There's no indication in the text that this was the wrong thing. People usually chalk this up to a lack of faith, but there's no indication of that in the text. God didn't say you have to do it during the day. So we see this idol torn down. We see this Asherah pole cut down. It's, it is interesting though when we see the men of the town uh, come and, and, and they want to kill Gideon. They want Joash to kill Gideon right? because he's done this thing. And It's interesting because it tells us earlier in the text that the altar of Baal belonged to Joash, Gideon's father. And yet, when we see this threat to Gideon's life, Joash is the one that stands up for him. It's kind of an odd detail in the text. But what did the angel promise? Don't fear, Gideon. You're not going to die. He's going to make whatever means necessary happen. And so Joash contends. He says, if Baal is upset about this, let Baal contend for himself. Let Baal, if he is this mighty, powerful God, let Baal smoke Gideon. Right? It's very akin to what we see Elijah do at 1 Kings 18 up on Mount Carmel. Right? Remember when the, 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 the priests of Baal were dancing around and they're cutting themselves and they're naked and they're dancing and everything. Right? And, he's, and Elijah's just laughing. He's like, let Baal do something for himself. And what does Baal do? Of course, nothing. Because he's not real. Right? And of course, God is. So He calls down the fire. It's very akin to that story. And similarly here, Joash says three times in the text the word contend. Let Baal contend for himself. And there's no indication from the text there was any more to it than that. You see the scene kind of end. Therefore on that day, Gideon was called Jerubbaal, which is to say let Baal contend against him. So we've seen the raising up of Gideon. Now we see this requirement of Gideon, this requirement, this boldness. What is happening here is that idols are being called out, exposed, and destroyed. It's not just the idol of Baal for the nation of Israel, which was needed to be purged. 
There's also idols within the heart of Gideon that need to be exposed. I, I find it fascinating that the text tells us that he did it overnight because he was afraid of his family and the men of the town. This town that he grew up in, this town's probably not that big. You can imagine the idols of the heart of Gideon. This, this, these idols of, of fear. These idols of family. The idols of people pleasing. The idols of, of town pride. The idols of wanting to please your father. All of the idols that might have been exposed there in Gideon when God said, take down that altar. You see Gideon not just being called up, raised up, promised God's power and presence, but he's also being challenged in his own idolatry, in his own sin to purge the idolatry of Israel. What idols is God calling out in you? Are you willing to have your idols exposed and destroyed? Or are you holding back on what God can do because you're clinging tightly onto everything that you need? You're holding on to everything in your life that's not God, clinging tightly because you're so afraid they're going to get exposed God is not going to exist along your idols. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. The raising up, the requirement, and finally we come to the revelation. You notice we skipped verses 33 to 35. We'll come back to those next time in Judges 7 because it's the gathering of the army. This man, it's amazing to think though, this man was cowering in a wine press 10 minutes ago and now he's gathering the armies of Israel for an attack on the Midianites after tearing down an altar. It's pretty incredible to see the, the transition here. We're told in those verses that the Spirit of the Lord has clothed Gideon and he assembles this army. And then in verses 33 to 36, we see God or Gideon again ask God for signs. Anybody that really thinks about the story of Gideon, the first thing that usually pops into people's heads uh, are the fleeces, right? And so we'll get to the fleeces here. He didn't ask God again for signs. There's a lot of confusion on this text, a lot of misunderstanding. Before we break it down, though, I just want us to sit for a second and focus on the incredible display of God's power that happens here. God literally reversed the laws of nature to prove to Gideon that he was with him. When dew is on the ground, fleece, a fleece laid on it gets wet, <laughs> fleece don't stay dry. A blanket doesn't stay dry, right? And yet, God reverses the laws of nature. The very laws of nature that He created, He reverses them so that Gideon might understand His power and His presence. So let's just notice that for a second. But understanding sort of the practical implications and the applications for this section are difficult. I've heard two very wrong approaches to this text. I'm not. If this is your approach, I'm not calling you out or anything. I just there are two two wrong approaches. The first one is for somebody to imitate Gideon in this, to the point where we do things like, God, if you want me to go to that college, then send me a sign. God, if you want me to take that job, send me a sign. Right? We do these things all the time. Right? This passage is not telling us to live our lives that way. Right? In fact, Jesus rebukes Satan for testing God. And in Matthew 4, we, we, we should not put God to the test. That's, that's not a good thing. That's a sin. So that's the first thing. Let's not imitate. The second, though, let's not automatically jump to this idea that, that Gideon is somehow this weak man lacking in faith. Right? Some would even say committing a sin of unbelief. Let's not jump to that conclusion either. What I think we're seeing here in this, in this story, especially as we think of it, both in the context of, uh, of, of battling against the idol of Baal, but also in the context of the Moses story, what I think we're seeing here, we're seeing Gideon not asking God to tell him what to do. He's already told him what to do. He's not trying to discern the will of God. What he is asking God to do is to display his nature and his character. He's asking God to reveal Himself. That's what's going on here. It's not, God, if You turn this fleece wet, then I'm going to go to battle with the Midianites. If You don't, then I'm going to sit here. That's not what's going on. He asked God to reveal something of His character and His nature so that He might understand fully what it means that God's power and presence are with Him. 
What we see time and time again through the stories of Judges in the Old Testament is that God is not afraid to humble Himself and stoop down to give strength to our fragile faith. To give strength to our weakness. I was not afraid to do that. This crossed my mind this week. My daughter Naomi, she got a bike for Christmas. Pretty adorable. Pretty awesome. It's got princesses on it. She got a helmet. She's very psyched about that, right? And so she's been picking up how to learn to ride this bike, right? And, and it's, been a, it's been a fun exercise uh, for both my father-in-law and, and for me. And so we're walking out to the, the, the sidewalk the other day, and, and Naomi looks up at me, and she says, Dad, if I'm, Daddy, if I'm going too fast, will you, will you slow me down? I don't want to crash or fall off. Now, I want you to think how ridiculous it would be for me to respond to her in some kind of sarcastic, mean way and said, of course I'm not going to let you fall. Don't be, don't be foolish. Or, yes, Naomi, I'm going to let you fall. Think about how ridiculous it would be to me, for me to respond to my three-year-old that way. No, what I said to her was, don't worry, Daddy's got you. I'm not going to let you crash. I'm not going to let you, uh, not going to let you fall off. But even if you fall off, you're going to be okay. Right? That's, what, that's what's going on here is that Gideon is afraid. Gideon's cautious. Gideon doesn't know what the other side holds, and he wants to know. What, what does it mean that God's power and presence is, are with me? And God, out of His grace, and you notice there's nowhere in the text where God rebukes Gideon for a lack of faith. Nowhere does he criticize Gideon. Nowhere does he call Gideon out. God graciously steps down and bolsters his fragile faith. And he performs a miracle. He performs a miracle so that Gideon might know who this God is. And here's the thing. As we think about our lives, as we think about our callings, as we think about all that we have to do, all that God's called us to do, we need to understand that this is still very much going on. What we see Gideon doing here is, is still very much going on. If you don't think you need your fragile faith bolstered by, by, by things, by seeing God's power, by seeing God's character, if you don't think you do, you need to think harder. I'll give you an example. The night before the Lord Jesus was to die on a cross, He sat with His disciples. Instead of a threshing floor, He had a table. And instead of a fleece and dew, He had bread and wine. And He said, this is My body which is given for you. And this is My blood which is the blood of the new covenant. Whenever you drink this and whenever you eat this, do it in remembrance of Me. Why is that, why is that a thing we do? Why is that a thing we do? It's a thing we do because every time we take that bread and every time we drink that cup, we are reminded of the power and the presence of God and the goodness of Him who sent Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, to dwell in our filth and our sin and our mess, to live a life that we never could, to go to the cross willingly as a sacrifice, to be consumed entirely as a pure sacrifice so that we might hear from God, peace be to you, Do not fear. You will not die. That's what's going on here. God is displaying. He's revealing Himself. And this seems kind of ridiculous to us because we have such an advantage over Gideon. We've seen such a greater revelation than the fleece and the dew. You realize we've seen the greatest revelation that has ever been revealed ever. The writer of Hebrews says that God spoke long ago through the prophets and through His Word, but now in our day, He speaks to us through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He speaks to us. He's revealed Himself in the person and work of Jesus Christ. The very imprint of His nature. The essence. We we did the Nicene Creed and we did that intentionally so that we might declare together who Jesus is. The essence. He is the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, come to earth to live amongst us. And in doing that, as we take the bread and drink the cup, we are reminded, first of all, of God's power and presence, but secondly, the fact that God has redeemed His people and God will deliver them time and time again. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. By God's grace, God's power, and God's presence, the coward Gideon becomes the conqueror. We'll see next time 
what that's going to lead to. But remember when and Paul writes in Romans 8, that because of the love of God, through the love of God, we are made more than conquerors through Him who loved us. If you're in Christ this morning, walk into 2024 with courage and with hope. Walk into 2024 with courage and hope. Remember Moses and Gideon. God can turn cowards into conquerors. And God can use you for mighty works. If you do not know this Savior, I invite you today to come and know this joy, this hope, this peace. Know what it is to hear, peace be to you. Do not fear, you will not die. Know what it is to hear, shalom. Let's pray.